Hello and welcome to our second edition of Groovecast, the podcast for the rhythm section musicians. Um, and before we get into today's into today's episode, Charlie, what have you been up to uh, this week? Anything interesting? Uh, it's been a, a busy week of sorts, but um, not nothing too too taxing. Uh, about twenty seven charts worth of uh, tunes worth of charting, which I did for some for some gigs in the next couple of weeks, and just some teaching, bit of planning few other things what about yourself um yeah i had uh as i said in the last uh podcast which um i'm sure it would have been months ago by the time uh we got these out and uh the way we're gonna release these but um i had a gig at the uh embassy theater here in skegness um for the comeback cabaret show uh, which was really exciting and uh one of the first sort of long days of uh rehearsals and everything that i've had for a while so a bit draining but um uh, if anybody does want to uh, watch that or um, if they're into either musical theatre or pop music or there's a va- vast uh, variety uh, of uh, music on there. So that's available on the Embassy Theatre um, Skegness YouTube channel and their Facebook page. So a little bit of a shameless plug there at the, the top of the Yeah, show. he's gone old salesman on us. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, shall we get right in to uh, our topic today? Yeah, so I think it's probably worth explaining uh, about we don't know what to expect from each other on this one, so I'm going to let Mr. Walker over there uh, explain roughly what's going on, and and then we'll just see what happens. Yeah, I think um, it's kind of one of the reasons we probably set up this podcast, and um, uh, I'd imagine we're going to have quite a few of these variations on this sort of theme is because it's a conversation I think most musicians have, most rhythm section players have, bass players and drummers, and but your favourite players and your favourite duos and bands and so on and so forth. Um, so we're going to... What better way to start our second episode than starting with a, a list, a cheeky little list there. Love and, a top uh, five. Yeah, love a top five. So this is going to be our top five bass and drum duos. And um, just so people are aware... Um, they don't have to have been in a band, for instance, uh, John Entwistle and um, Keith Moon or something. Um, it can be people that have played together live on recordings and generally just good pairings that we like. And um, we're kind of going on our influences, I imagine, and um, what we like as well. And little disclaimer, we're not saying that these are the best ever. This is just our opinions. And Yeah, um, these, are, these are our favourites. And... Yeah. You know, there'll probably be a few on this list that we disagree with, but mm. that's that's what opinions are about. So, yeah, it is worth knowing. Neither of us know what each other has picked. We've deliberately no. kept quiet about it, and <laughs> everything that you're about to hear, uh, we're about to hear. So it's going to be a total surprise. And I, yeah, I don't know about you. I, it was actually really hard to nail it down to to, to five yeah. picks. Um, as you'll probably we'll probably get into more as as we go along. It was. I mean, for one thing, it's a vast variety of choice. And for me, I didn't want to be overly obvious either. I wanted to pick a couple mo- a couple of more out there choices as well. Um, Definitely. So, yeah, I think... Do you want me to kick us off? Yeah, I'll just... The last thing I'll add is if we do get time, we'll, um, we can say some additional ones that we easily could have interchanged because... And and uh, I'm sure in the future with uh, the other lists that we do and different the other other favourites and other obvious choices will get covered at some point. So do not fret. Yeah, just um, stay tuned. Yeah. So anyway, Charlie, kick us off with your fifth pick. Yeah. So not only was picking five really hard, getting an order down was was really hard. So I mean, any of these five, especially the that I'm going to cover uh, could have been number one because they're all amazing. So to kick us off, um, my first pick, if you like, was uh, Sting and Stuart Copeland, Ooh. which is, uh, I think, just taken you by surprise a little bit. Yeah, it was a wild card. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, what I always really liked about, about The Police in, in particular was it's such a melting pot of of influences that have gone into that. So you've got Sting coming from a jazz background of doing the doing the rounds with jazz and 
and jazz fusion band uh, up in Newcastle. Uh, and then you've got Stuart Copeland, who is like, well, he's the most physical infestation of, of um, animal from the Muppets that you could think of when you put someone behind a drum kit. <laughs> um, and he's, you know, got this massive reggae funk and almost punk influence to the way he plays. And as as rhythm sections go, I think it's just a great combination of all those influences that come together um, to make a you know a band that really worked. And when you when you especially when you're playing in a trio, your bass player and your drummer, if it's drums, bass, and guitar, they have to hold their legs of the stand up. You can't have a trio with a musician who's just a, okay. It, mm. it just doesn't work. Um, and it's actually interesting looking down my lists. There's a couple of uh, sections here from trios which I think goes to show something that if you you've got to be really good to play in a trio mm. but yeah so going back to the, the police and the, and the music you know you've got some such a wide variety of stuff that they've done so if you think of the driving punk kind of things like syn- uh, synchronicity too which that could quite easily have been a, a great almost prog rock song with the story and everything that goes with it and the, the moods that it moves through but it's done as like a really driving, fast punk rock, which mm. which just works for me. But you've also got, you know, the uh, the the other end of the song spectrum with something like "Every Breath You Take" or or "Wrapped Around Your Finger," which is so more uh, so much more subtle and um, melodic that they've mm. they've worked into it. I mean, it was interesting in preparing for this. I read a, a great interview with Stuart Copeland where he said that some of those songs. They could have easily been, you know, prog rock songs if they, if mm. rather than, you know, a, a two minute in and out police song. But yeah, I mean, as far as the way that they both play, Sting has always had this kind of really solid foundation. Sting really, I think, holds that band together with the bass line. It's very, he doesn't go too complicated if he doesn't need to. Um, whereas Stuart Copeland is, is, is the total polar opposite. Everything's going to be really busy really crazy there's loads of um, splash cymbals and octobans and everything going on but as a drummer he's playing very very melodically mm. everything that he puts there is is there for a reason so uh it's all very busy but also really really tasteful and, and most of all which i think is a key to all the rhythm section players that we're going to look at it's appropriate to the song yeah yeah I think that's a that's a great pick and something I wouldn't have. I think that's interesting because um, I think our lists are going to be similar in a lot of ways in terms of why we've chosen players, but it's also going to be very different in terms of our personal sort of what we would listen to. I think in terms of um, um, the variety of music that we both listen to, there is a point where it kind of separates at like. I I per I do like Sting in the Police, but it's not something I've ever got heavily into. Whereas I've probably got more into the disco and funky things, maybe. And um, so I think that's interesting with um, that because my uh, number five, if you're prepared for uh, yeah, go ahead, to go get ahead. Into this is um, uh, my number five pick is Bernard Edwards and Tony Thompson from uh, the band Chic. Great um, choice. Great choice. Which I was like you said trying to pick five was just incredibly hard. I had, I mean, on the additional list, I have another like fifteen that I could have easily had in there. <laughs> um, and in terms of Chic as well, it was tough to choose between the original sort of lineup of Bernard Edwards and Tony Thompson, who obviously, I mean, Bernard Edwards played on all of Chic stuff and and co-wrote so much of it. And um, but Tony Thompson was only on the first couple of albums, I think. I don't, and um, I think uh, was it Omar Hakim came in and he yeah, he toured so. with them for a bit. He could have easily been on on the other side. And now the modern chic lineup with uh, Jerry Barnes on bass, I could have easily yeah, chosen and, him. And Ralph Roll on kit at the moment yeah. as well, who's a, a phenomenal player. Yeah, um, and singing player as well. You yeah, know, that, absolutely. And, and Jerry Barnes sings and plays as well. So, I mean, it could easily have changed. But for me, um, this is definitely more of a personal pick in terms of influence. I think Bernard Edwards was one of the first bass players I was aware of. 
Um, and certainly one of the chic stuff was the first kind of complex stuff, if you like, that I got into in terms of um, like Le Freak and Good Times. I mean, Good Times is obviously just an iconic bass um, anthem, if you like. And um, I think the thing that Bernard Edwards uh, did best was, I mean, he was sort of complex in a lot of ways, but he could easily just lock in with the drums. And I think the thing that I wrote down with, with Sheik is like, it's almost a pre-programmed groove. Like everything they played, like in every record, it was always like the same solid groove, disco beat, Tony Thompson locking in with um, Bernard Edwards, uh, Nile Rogers like machine gun style guitar, just jink, jink, jink. Like on every record, it was almost the same, but it worked for everything and it wasn't samey. No, and like. it was, it, I, I think with them as well, so sampleable. Yeah. Uh, as, as, as the whole kind of industry turned to that at around that point where you mm. had DJs and things starting to come in and, and of course the whole the whole rap thing kicked off with rapper's delight yeah which was which was a total chic rip off yeah um and obviously after sort of chic's career sort of ended in the late 70s or their original stuff they then went on now rogers and bernard edwards went on to write stuff for madonna bowie duran duran you can go on and on and, and now rogers is still having an amazing career now doing that and is remaining relevant, and I think Bernard Edwards was a huge part of that, and um, and and just influenced so many other bass players as well. I don't think any bass player, um, if you're talking about these lists, I think Bernard Edwards is always going to be in there high up. And you know, from that period, I was thinking of people like Larry uh, Larry Graham, Stanley Clark, um, you know, Marcus Miller that they they could ease it and Jacko Pastorius they could all from this era they could all be in there but for my per just the personal side of it that's why uh, Bernard Edwards had to get in there and Tony Thompson just because I just really loved his sound and I love that disco that disco feel and I think that a lot of that came from him and um, the way they locked in together was just amazing it's still one of my favorite bands so that's my number five pick so that's a, yeah great choice um, you know, I I have nothing to disagree with there. I think you you were absolutely spot on with with everything that you were, <laughs> every point that you made. So yeah, I mean, great pairing. And and as you said, I mean, all the chic lineups over the years have been have been fantastic, and they still are uh, yeah. to this day. But moving on to number four, yeah. and I think this is probably going to be another curveball thrown <laughs> your way. But um, yeah, uh, I've gone for uh, Simon Phillips and Anthony Jackson. Ooh. Okay. So, these these two musicians are, are both pretty 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 well considered virtuoso <laughs> session players. Yeah. Uh, especially within that jazz jazz fusion sort of realm. Mm. Of course, Simon's background was was doing uh, so many sessions through the seventies and and then into into Toto and all of that kind of thing and working with Pete Townsend, Anthony Jackson doing. Uh, coming up as a, I think, a more of a jazz player, but um, the the project that that really made me nail this one down were um, the Hiromi trio that they did with the uh, the Japanese uh, girl piano player, who's just a phenomenal pia- uh, piano player and can uh, really was some of that was so so complicated. Some of the the tunes they were playing with with her, and of course they just grew through it like it was. Like it was nothing. Uh, the the other things they've done together, they did uh, Simon's Force Majeure album, uh, Anthony played on, which was one of Simon's solo albums, and then also on on some of his um, instructional drum DVDs. Uh, was uh, Anthony was in the lineup, and yeah, I mean they, the thing that just made makes me a, a, a love their playing is just that some of it is so unconventional. You know, I mean you've got as a as a bass player, I think Anthony Jackson was one of the first people to to use six string basses. In fact, I think he practically mm. designed them. And yeah. Simon Phillips, of course, I mean from day one, pretty much always had a big kit. You know, two bass drums, eight toms, whatever. But he also taught, <laughs> and I love the the story uh, he tells about him. He taught himself to play left handed and not cross his hands over to use the hi-hats uh, simply because he wanted to have another tom-tom there and he didn't want to raise it up so that he, 
it, he could hit it properly with the hi hats at a normal height uh, because it didn't look cool. He wanted everything to be on the same same level, and so the hi hats got lowered, and he taught himself to play left handed. And I, I just think the dedication in doing that at the time was was crazy, but mm. it's definitely paid off for him. And now he's, I mean, he's one of those drummers I would absolutely consider to be pretty well ambidextrous. He's yeah, he's so so good and he can actually not only can he play both ways but he can groove like hell both mm. ways uh, and, and it only takes watching some of those um watching some of those live things that, that, that they've done i mean the, the hiromi trio has been through a couple of lineup changes over the years uh, i think steve smith did it for a while and there's definitely been a couple of other players that have been in and out of, of that gig but for me, I think the definitive lineup was definitely with 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 Simon in there, and it just it just worked. You know, they had this there's some great footage online from from jazz festivals and things that they've done, and um, and it's just that the chemistry is there. You know, even though they're sat twenty foot away from each other on stage, they're all totally into what they're doing. They know where they are, and it's just a level of playing that's. That that just seems so far beyond most of the most of the people. So mm. so yeah, that was uh, that's kind of my second pick. And to to sum it up, it's complex jazz fusion, but locked together and with such a pocket and groove. And and I think that that word pocket, those words pocket and groove are something that are probably going to flash up a few times over the course of, yeah. of this episode. I I really like that pick, and I'm really glad actually that you've got Anthony Jackson in there because literally making this list i was thinking there's got to be some way that i can get him in there um but no absolute monster players both of them as well incredible and like you say anthony jackson influential on the six string bass and um it's really funny because at the moment uh i've been trying to learn um a piece called we three uh with anthony jackson dave weckle um and i forget the piano player's name it's his record but i just didn't I knew how good Anthony Jackson was as a session player and with Paul Simon and um just so and I've seen him on stuff like that but I I didn't realize how good he was in terms of yeah the jazz fusion side like you said and I think again if in terms of bass players he's always going to be up I'd say he's in the top 10 really the you know at least of the best that there ever was and uh, uh, yeah I think that's a great pick and uh, definitely contrasts my next pick <laughs> um uh, i think this one um isn't a curveball to you because you kind of called it really um but, and they these guys weren't even in my list when i i did my first couple of drafts and i didn't even um one of my favorite bands is uh, of course fourth peck and uh if anybody hasn't heard of them or seen them you gotta check them out and um but the thing with Wolfpack is that they don't have a set drummer um, for their, especially for their own stuff. They have Jack Stratton and Theo Katzman, who both jump on the kit and are both equally brilliant. And um, Joe Dart, the bass player, just he's done a few clinics and he always talks about locking in with the drummer, and that's one of the most uh, keeping time and everything. And and the feel is almost one of the most important. Well, it is, I think, the most important thing for a bass player and locking in with the drummer, especially for the funk side of things. Um, and he does that brilliantly with any drummer he play, plays with. But in terms of my favorite, this guy would be one of my favorite drummers anyway. And because he has played with Joe Dart quite a lot, um, I'm going to go for Joe Dart and uh, Nate Smith. Um, and I think this is co a good contrasting one as well because it's from the modern era, a bit more of a modern one. Um, uh, Joe Dart obviously has commercialised bass, I think, in a lot of ways and brought it to uh, the front of the band a bit more. I mean, there's a lot of people that talk about Wolfpack not being the same and Joe Dart is Wolfpack and I'm not so sure about that, but he certainly wouldn't be the same without him. It's like... Um, almost like when Weather Report lost Jacko, it was you kind of can't imagine them without uh, him. Obviously, Weather Report carried on all right, but uh, um, they didn't so do think badly. They didn't do too badly, um, but uh, yeah. So he, I thought he brought it to the front of the band a bit more, and people who weren't even interested in music or not musical people 
you know, they sing the bass lines at the concert, so I haven't seen many things where they uh, that's been done before. And I think they tap into something um, either psychedelic or retro or woke or whatever you want to call it. That like it just attracts people, and and they've started from scratch really. And he's been there from the start. Uh, solid groove, and he can easily just rip into that bass whenever he likes. Um, and the the Red Rocks concert that they've done every year, um, the first one of the first times they did that, just really made me almost fall in love with music, kind of again, and just inspired me. And um, I mean, anyone who hasn't seen any Wolfpack, or go on YouTube and watch the Red Rocks um, 2017 concert because it's just something totally different. And um, I'd say watch at least half, you know, give it half an hour. Um, because I know I showed it to my dad and he wasn't sure to start with, but now he loves Wolfpack and that's uh, that's an achievement. And that Charlie knows my dad, so and how open-minded he can be, so <laughs> that's an achievement. And um, and then Nate Smith is just obviously he's he's almost the more well-educated person. He's come in to Wolfpack uh, on live shows and he does the Fearless Flyers with them as well, which is a kind of spin-off group um, from Wolfpack. Um, and yeah, well educated, experienced, very versatile. He can play funk. He plays stuff with Wolfpack where he's literally just got a snare and a kick drum, I think. And you know, and he doesn't sound like it needs anything else. Um, and now lately, he has been playing a full kit, and it's and the way to sort of I don't know how he does it to write for just a snare drum and a kick drum on some of those songs and play it for that. And then he plays the same songs on a full kit and just makes it work and it, without it sounding like it was missing it before. Um, and I, I didn't actually know because I obviously heard of him first through Wolfpack. Um, you know, he's played with the likes of John Patitucci. Um, you know, you can play that fusion stuff. Incredible playing different time signatures. I was lucky enough to see his group, uh, Kinfolk, in uh, Denver, um, Colorado. And the encore he always does, uh, I'm not sure if he still does it, um, but is the thing where he claps and it's in different, you have to clap and it's in different time signatures. And I just think he's an, a great showman as well. Um, can be a Patatucci or a Weckle and, and just sort of sit in there and uh, groove and, and do the fusion stuff, but also can be a showman and a band leader. So, uh, And I think together they, they've both been uh, pretty successful so far, so... Uh, that's a little bit more of a personal one for me again, but um, that's my number four pick. Yeah. Love that, and and yeah, I think the the words that definitely come to mind. And watch this for a link is um, tasteful <laughs> minimalism. Yeah. And speaking of tasteful minimalism, <laughs> brings us quite nicely onto my <laughs> number three pick, which is um, Steve Gadd and Jimmy Johnson. Yes. So of course these two have been playing together in. Um, in James Taylor's band for for a lot of years now, they've done they've done long a long spell in in that band. I mean, for me, Steve Gadd and any bass player sounds fantastic, and you know I've I've had the pleasure of seeing him with a couple of different lineups, and he, as a drummer, he is I would argue the most prolific player out there today, mm. and. I think that between the two of them, they've just got this this absolute knowledge of knowing how to play just what's required, no more, and but play it so perfectly and so tight, so in the pocket. There's that word again, and um, and it's it it's just a a, a masterclass to watch them play, and um, I think that the key with it is using space rather than being busy. You know, of course, you can be busy, but they always know how to stop being busy and just give it some space, give it some, give it some time and feel, and and that really is 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 where where it really gets special because you could give a lot of the tunes that they play. You know, a lot of it's very very, with especially on the James Taylor thing, it's rather commercial in in a lot mm. of ways, and very simple, and it's having the that ability to play the simple things perfectly. That, that really gets me with, with both of them. Um, but in their other guys, if you like, which is um, that they both play in the 
in Steve Gadd's solo band, the Steve Gadd Band, and again have done for a, for a long time. And the Steve Gadd Band is, is, to all intents and purposes, it's basically James Taylor's band without James Taylor. Um, and I had the pleasure of seeing them at, at Ronnie Scott's uh, two years ago now. And that was just a a total masterclass. I went with with the three other musician friends, and we were all sat about ten foot from from where Jimmy and Gad were, uh, and we were all just so into it. You know, it was it was one of those those gigs that could have they could have played five sets, and we would have still been so so locked into watching them and and and. F- getting that feel for the groove that you, you just can't get from, from a lot of other players, hmm. you know, and it's, it takes something to go into, especially into a jazz club and play some, some more straight ahead funk or some Latin influences, some, some more laid back feels and just to do it with such conviction and such perfection. It, it, it just, it's one of those for me, it's one of those duos that you cannot beat. Hmm. Yeah. I, again, I'm, I'm, I think that's a great pick, and um, I'm glad as well that you've got Steve Gadd in there because, um, again, I was thinking of you can't think of uh, drummers and uh, drummers and bass players locking in without thinking of Steve Gadd. Um, and 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 uh, sorry, go on. Yeah. No, I was going to say that was it. I mean, just thinking about it, I could have gone with Gad and Anthony Jackson, and that would have yeah. been another fantastic pairing mm. uh, because of all of the Paul Simon stuff that they did. Yeah. But it's... That was the hard thing. It was it was knowing the players that you wanted to, to definitely highlight, but thinking, yeah, they've worked with 20 different bass players and all of them were great. And I'm sure you had the same with drummers who were, you think, yeah, well, they've worked with Weckl and they've worked with yeah. Vinnie Colliuta and they've worked with Gad and... Yeah, they were all so good. <laughs> yeah, I think um, Steve Gadd's just one of those like industry standard what you imagine a drummer to be. Uh, like you say, minimalism, you know, uh, doesn't overcomplicate things. Just a solid drummer, and uh, that's a really good point about you make about space because I think that is a thing that we all try to do. Maybe when we're thinking of a solo or something, is try and fill it out. Um, but the space can be just speak just as much as the notes that you play in a solo or and certainly Steve Gadden does that and Jimmy Johnson as well. He's not not somebody I was I've been aware of, of that long, only a few years really. Um my dad again is a, a massive James Taylor fan. Um and I think he saw them uh in Birmingham when Jimmy and, and Steve were in the band. And um and he once I obviously picked up bass, he said you need to listen to this guy, and um, and I I know from yourself a really nice guy as well, and uh, both of them very grounded. Yeah, people. Jimmy Jimmy Johnson is the sort of person who can walk straight in Ronnie Scott's straight from the stage to the bar, and be yeah. just the coolest guy post gig with a cocktail in his hand, having a chat to whoever was passing by, and it's like, you know that that is how you be a successful musician but still that down-to-earth guy, you know? Yeah. Because he could have quite easily, you know, and all of those these guys could quite easily be, you know, very sort of, sort of, you know, I do my job, I go home. Yeah. But to stand and hang about at the end of the gig and see who was on on the, the late show that night or whatever, that was the kind of guy that, that Jimmy uh, was. And Gad, of course, was... I mean, Gad was more in demand for, <laughs> from yeah. a room full of drummers, so he was <laughs> he was out and signing things. But um, but you know, even just talking to, to to Steve and 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 to Jimmy, it was just you know that's that's what I think people like us aim to be in forty years' time. You know, we want to be those guys who are still going. They've still got it. They're still, I would argue, pretty much at their peak. You know, I mean, Steve Gad's peak's been going on since about what nineteen seventy two. Yeah. <laughs> When you when you did the 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 Asia thing with Steely Dan, so yeah, I I, I just think you you'd struggle to find a, a bad record that that they've played on. Mm. And I think um, interesting you bring up Asia because I think um, I was hesitant to put uh, Steely Dan players in because I thought um, like we've spoken about um, between you know uh, me and we've spoken about. 
um you know, we'll probably cover steely dan at some point in the future and it could and probably could take up a, a pod an episode or two um, yeah that, that there's definitely an episode's worth in in just in steely dan rhythm sections over the years yeah so um that's why i was a little hesitant but I'm, again i'm i'm uh, really glad you got steve gad in there um so my number three pick um i think this one may not surprise you um is lawrence cottle and ian thomas classic absolutely yeah. classic um and just i mean everybody knows i'm I, if you're listening to this podcast and it's up your street, I'm sure you'll know of these two anyway, but uh, just an incredible relationship. I think they've been playing with each other since the 80s, maybe the early 90s, and I th- just top of the line. I mean, in terms of that word again, industry standard, I think these two, in what you want between a bass player and a drummer, I think these two fill it. Um, and if you've got the budget to get them for a gig, I think, you know... Um, you know all these top guys i think uh that are touring i think they try you've got to try and get these two because they're just the best um uh versatile lawrence obviously has a background of play he's played on everything and with everyone um he played on a black sabbath album didn't he and uh and you know and and a nice guy as well he's not got any pre um you know he's he's doesn't uh, look down on any work or anything or because of oh, it's Black Sabbath or whatever you know, he could sight read uh, Chick Corea Spain you know, he could do anything and um, and uh, amazing at writing his own stuff um, as we mentioned uh, in the last podcast uh, Charlie and myself played through one of his tunes um, Bittersweet and just a great funk player jazz, classical he can just do everything and in terms of the best sort of bass players i think in the world he's in my uh if i was seeing the best bass players in the world i'd definitely have him uh either there or thereabouts really and the modern day jacko really now uh and also we knew jacko as well of course so um and then ian is uh ian's one of those people that um i was very lucky to see um, to get the chance to see Mark Knopfler at the Albert Hall it was one of the first concerts I went to, and Ian was on drums. And um, funnily enough, my bass teacher knew Ian back in the late seventies because um, I'm not. I think they were both did a summer season or something at a Haven camp or, or a Warners or something in Somerset, I think. And then they both went on a cruise ship together. And Ian was. He said Ian was amazing then, and he was about. 15 20 years younger than my bass teacher so he was just a kid really um and then uh you know has worked his way up from nothing both of them have and um ian's just another one that isn't over complicated and he can do those mark Knopfler things and do the eric clapton stuff and lock in and just sit there and hold it down and then you see him doing this stuff with Lawrence Cottle on um, YouTube. Make sure to go check out uh, Lawrence's YouTube channel and uh, his big band because, you know, they're both just ripping it apart there. And um, and the, the relationship they have as a bass player and a drummer, like Lawrence can go and fly up the dusty end of the bass and do the Jacko stuff and Ian can hold it down. And uh, then vice versa, Lawrence will just hold down the groove and Ian can fly if you like and... Um, there's a great video on YouTube of them playing the chicken, uh, just in a pub, I think, in London, um, which I've watched an, uh, just an, a ridiculous amount of times. <laughs> and um, I think that's also one of the highlights of 2020 for me, was seeing all the stuff that Lawrence was doing and um, recordings and playing on other people's stuff. Because um, he's such a busy guy, you don't get to see a lot of that. Um, but obviously since the lockdowns and everything he's just been in demand still and releasing stuff and uh, and uh, just a nice guy um, and he's uh, got it, the practice and the scales and everything warming up he knows so much about bass and um, again you know check out his channels check out um, the teaching stuff he's done because um, learning about how to warm up properly for a bass player and stuff you wouldn't have even thought about he's got it covered so check him out and um i think that pretty much other than everything i've just said speaks for itself lawrence cottle and ian thomas yeah i think for for me those two absolutely fall into the category of players players they are the people who the average member of the 
the average listener of whoever wouldn't know who they were. But you you ask a musician about them, and they'll be, you know, we we people like us, we know those players, and we know how great they are, and how underrated, really, yeah. in the grand scheme of things, uh, they both are. And yeah, it, it's it's. I'm glad you've 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 got those in the list. And um, yeah, moving on to to number two. Yeah, go ahead. and I think this is going to be my equivalent of, of Wolfpack mm. for you. This is going to be the predict the predictable choice, uh, and it's Neil Peart and Geddy Lee. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it, this is uh, for those who don't know. I'm a huge Rush fan and have been for for a, a long time, and I did have the pleasure of seeing them uh, live in concert on a couple of occasions, and and I was blown away every single time. Um, I think. For for those two guys, having mainly worked in really worked in the same band for forty something years, uh, between nineteen seventy four and when they finished their final tour in in twenty fifteen, you know, to to have main, maintained that for so long, I think is just something that most bands w- wouldn't even dream of. Um, and. Again, this comes back to the same thing about having to hold up the legs of a table uh, if you're in a trio. <laughs> it's, you know, you. I think you'd struggle to find a more accomplished trio than Rush, uh, mm. especially within that hard rock, prog rock kind of domain, because no one has no one has done it before or since to that that level of proficiency as, as and musicality as as players. Uh, but also, they the, the the thing that always baffles me with them is is how they can make such complex music sound so simple. Yeah, you know you can you know you see a lot of prog rock bands and you know, you see the concerts and everything. And no one claps along. Rush, everyone claps along. You know, it, it's one of the few bass player drummer combos who you can go to a concert and see people air basing or air drumming every single fill all the way through the concert every time and uh, if there is one video that has to be pointed out here it's um, the live version of YYZ the, the instrumental that they did in in Rio in 2002 on the on the Russian Rio DVD and uh, you know you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of um, Brazilian fans singing an instrumental how many concerts do you see people singing an instrumental i just think that was it is one of the most ridiculous and amazing things that i've i've ever seen uh on video or anything but i think that the musicianship between the two of them is just to another level i mean they're both i think it's safe to say in, in that field were innovators of the of what they did you know they weren't just tied to their instruments either. Geddy Lee was bringing keyboards and pedal bass in. Neil was bringing samplers, uh, acoustic and electronic percussion, you know. And to make that big of a sound from a trio is just is is incredible. And to to reiterate, they never ever used backing tracks. Everything mm. you heard at a concert was triggered in some way by them on stage. There was no clicks. If there was a sequence of playing. Neil was playing to the sequence, so he wasn't ha- having a click in his ear or anything. He just had the sound, and to 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 get to that level of of technicality and and stuff is just um, is just beyond definitely any other rhythm section in that domain. And I think mm. everyone, especially in that that prog rock and and just in the rock category in general, everyone aspires to get to that level of of, of playing as far as a, a, a as rhythm sections go for me. Mm. yeah i think the again this is one of the uh sort of picks where we sort of part in terms of our influences because again i knew of rush obviously but it wasn't any because nobody was saying to listen to it i didn't it wasn't something i was into because um you know my dad it was kind of think too late for my dad to be into in terms of his age um and my bass teacher um was more of the yes era which obviously influenced Rush. Um, yeah. So it was like Chris Squire obviously influenced um, Geddy Lee. And um, I, I, I think uh, the thing of being able to commercial commercialise that prog rock 
in a way without sort of um losing the integrity of it yeah almost. yeah that's it and and like you say clapping along and they've bought um to be and to get nominated for the rock and roll hall of fame as well and um yeah there's, there's an interesting in, story um, behind that because that yeah <laughs> that the uh <laughs> rolling stone who of course runs the rock and roll hall of fame they were against them for years you know they made them out to be all sorts of mm. things and and it took, I think it was a Rush fan protest outside the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, where thousands of fans turned up to say, "We belong in here." Yeah. <laughs> That's what it took to, to to get them there. And to quote Neil's uh, induction speech, uh, he said, uh, "We've been saying for years that this isn't a big deal. Turns out it kind of is." Yeah. <laughs> that just sums it up, you know. And to 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 have that those legions of fans. Um, who was stuck by them all through, you know, because Rush, the sound changed with every album, you know, they they changed with the times, they weren't just going to be you know, the first couple of albums very, very Led Zeppelin in sound mm. you know, with the high-pitched vocals and, and the, the really angry, rocky guitars um, but then they move into this kind of as the 80s rolled in, they went with keyboards and became took the new wave influences, reggae influences, then mm. later on it was world music and West African influences and then into the the 90s it was some of the funk and the and and the fusion influence. So it was it was definitely one of those sounds that never changed and to have mm. fans who no matter what you were putting out loved the material is 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 just something really special. Yeah. Um, yeah and that's one that i i could have predicted would be in there and um a little bit surprised that you haven't got it at number one but still number like you said they could easily be number one um, yeah any of these and, five could have easily been number one yeah um okay so my number two is probably the most obvious in terms of commercial bass and drum duos and it is of course paul mccartney and uh, ringo Starr. Um, and there's not a lot that needs to be said about it. They obviously changed music completely. Uh, McCartney uh, brought bass to the to the front of the band a bit more. Obviously, a singing player, and in the start, just solid at locking in with Ringo. And on those early appearances, um, the way they filled out the sound, um, Ringo with his hi hats washing across them, and um, uh, and McCartney just sort of locking in with him but they didn't think in terms of that locking in they just did it and it worked and um uh and then obviously later on um these melodic sort of bass lines in you know stuff like something um is rolling sort of rocky bass lines in things like hey bulldog um you could go on and on but um very underrated he's either one of the He's either the most underrated bass player or the most overrated bass player, and uh, you can decide which. But um, he's either at the top of people's lists that um, don't aren't that musical, but kind of think of bass players, or he's at the bottom because they think, oh well, you know, he's not actually that great and all this, and you know, only plays with a pick or whatever. But you can't argue with. Um, I mean, I just think underrated, really, and and to be able to sing and play a lot of those bass lines, um, you know, I do a bit of singing and playing, and you get a full appreciation of how complicated it is, and and also a, an appreciation for drummers and how you and the um, being able to multitask there as well, and uh, and of course Ringo changed drums, um, and. Am I right in saying he's is he one of the first or the first drummer to play um, not the traditional hand uh, holding the sticks the traditional way or something? That was definitely of the fashion at the time. So it it was coming out of the jazz players of the fifties that you you start to see tradi uh, traditional grip being kind of dropped in favour of match grip. I don't know definitively who was one of the first, but he was definitely one of the most commercial players to do it and, yeah. and to not play uh, in the traditional style. But I mean, I'm just going to slide this along into a good link, which is uh, this would this was my number one pick. So we may as well just continue this conversation. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to pull the snap card because because uh, <laughs> we both we both picked this, which I kind of knew we would. Um, yeah. And I wasn't sure where on the list you would place it, but 
it was uh, it's worked out quite nice in where you've put it. So uh, yeah, for me it was with with both of them. It's 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 the innovation, and they didn't they didn't feel like they had to follow what had come before. They took influence from it, sure, but they broke the mold. They did things differently. I mean, listening to as you mentioned a track like something. I'm pretty sure that bass pattern was put over after the after the fact. So they laid a, a rhythm track down, then put the bass on, which mm. is why McCartney went a bit more out there with it. Which, which to the song, it, it was perfect. Yeah. But a, a couple of other tracks that I would have to to throw in into the mix of of just you know things that don't follow the the really don't follow the the format if you like which is um rain in one which f- for a drummer is just the fills in there are, are just fantastic and this this stems uh, in both the tracks i'm going to mention from ringo being left-handed and playing mm. on a right-handed kit so everything he's every every groove he's leading with his right hand but as soon as he plays a fill the left hand has to go first it doesn't matter mm. where he's going he said uh and, and listening to him talk about it, he says whenever he goes to play a fill, he has to physically stop to get his left hand ready to to do what it's going to do. So if yeah. the fills in the fills in rain are all really stabby and really kind of unorthodox because he's using his left hand to lead. So everything's got to give it time to get round the kit, and something like that are just just really innovative, almost ac- to an accidental level that it just it worked and people are still revering about it today. The other track, which is an obvious bass and drum uh, uh, collaboration was Come Together. Mm. Yeah. Which which is just, I think that is the pinnacle of, of all Beatles songs as far as having the drum and bass right there with each other. And, and that just so locked in with all of those figures. You know, it's I don't think there's ever been another pair like them and I don't think there ever will be because it's just, they were so prolific at the time and not only were they great players, they were great arrangers, they were great producers and most importantly, they were incredible songwriters, Mm. you know. And I did, I've I've, I've had the the pleasure of seeing both of them live uh, separately. I've seen McCartney twice and and I saw Ringo at... um, in Liverpool in about 2011 at the theatre there with the All Star Band, but then I got the opportunity of a lifetime basically handed to me. I went and saw Paul McCartney in 2018 at the O2 mm. uh, in London, and who should join him for the encore but Ringo and uh, Ronnie Wood from the Rolling Stones, uh, and it, as musical collaborations go, that was about the best you're going to get. Yeah, you know, I got two Beatles and a Rolling Stone in one night. I could have died happy <laughs> after that, because it's it's the kind of thing you never expect to happen. You know, you you see, they they, especially with Ringo and McCartney, it's not like they're doing joint tours together. They they do a little reunion maybe at the, at the Grammys or something, or in New York if they both happen to be in town. It doesn't mm-hmm. generally happen, especially this side of the pond, which is a shame, and. You would have, you would always think if it was going to happen over here, it would happen in Liverpool. But so to have it happen in London was just really, really magical, and mm. um, and that certainly is a night I'll never forget. Yeah, I think um, just to end my little segment on McCartney and Ringo as well is um, again Ringo is one of those drummers that um, people sometimes put down or say you know he's not as good as people make him out to be, but regardless of um the opinions of of that and the opinion of that and McCartney being uh, overrated everything they played worked for the songs and you couldn't imagine them without those fills or without those melodic bass lines or um so yeah that was that's a good number one pick for you and I'll end on uh, my number one pick which is uh, um John Patitucci and Dave Weckl um which is just from the other end of the spectrum. Um, uh, Patatucci is one of those, again, I wasn't aware of till a few years ago um, when I was getting really into the Wolfpack side of things and Joe Dart and um, 
kind of was comfortable in the music that I I enjoyed and then uh just like my dad usually does he would then uh get me into something else and he said you've got to um get on the, the YouTube on the TV uh, got a match uh, the chick uh, electric band chick career electric band and um that just blew me away my i think my jaw was on the floor the the whole video it was incredible and after that i just was i, I think i was quoted as saying everything has changed um and um like i said before with lawrence i mean patatucci's i think he's the best bass player in the world really i mean um it's it'd be hard to find the same versatility in other players and um he can play anything really i mean again one of those players who innovated on the six string bass and was an innovator there um in the early 80s i think and um d can do all that chick korea stuff he does his own music he can play classical bass he's amazing on upright bass um and a really nice guy very lucky to see the chick korea acoustic band in at ronnie scott's um, in 2018 and um, it, it it wasn't something I was that into sort of the upright side of it and I didn't know too much about the acoustic band other than a few tracks um, I knew about the electric band but not the acoustic band and uh, it was just again just jaws were on the floor every you could see everybody around the room was just blown away from it and it was an incredible experience and now obviously that uh, sadly Chick has passed away that uh, I feel even more lucky that we were able to see it then um, and uh, in terms of Dave Weckl again just another industry standard drummer and kind of similar to Gad in many ways in terms of um, the work that he's done or or has uh, it's or similar styles but sort of more complex obviously sort of centers around that fusion uh, jazz and funk um, again has his own bands which are incredible um, and you know he can do all that ripping into the drums and, and doing all that stuff and as well with the acoustic band they did some ballads and he was just so delicate and the way he sh uh, would strike every cymbal or pick up his it was all really deliberate and calculated and it just really made me have a new appreciation for drummers and I remember after listening to Got A Match, um, my dad got out the, his old CD of that album of the uh, uh, Electric City with Electric City on. And um, uh, I had it in the car a lot of the time and in bands I was doing at the time, me and the drummer were just trying to emulate that in some way. And still are. I still am anyway. It spurred me on to get a six string bass. And um, I think Chick Corea's band of, Chick, John Patitucci and Dave Weckl with the acoustic band and with the electric band I think is the best uh, amalgamation, it's a big word of musicians um, and like you said, the trios and you can't, you have to pull your weight and um, and it could be argued uh, other trios are better or more versatile but I think in terms of the musicianship and just the playing being on another planet really i think they're the best trio musically and all equal chick career was one of the best piano players there ever was but so was jump they were all like the best of their at the top of their line of work like john patitucci's probably the best bass player dave weckles one of the best drummers and um so I, it just had to be that for me just for my personal the influence of them and because of the musicianship i just and the last thing i'll uh, say on this is that i always think of people like lawrence and john and all the people on this list really and your list they're so at the top of their game and so such amazing players that we try and strive to be that when you get to that level you must have no worries about anything you know um you, when you like us or i certainly am you know i'm thinking about practicing and i'm thinking of ways to improve and you don't worry about it, but it is something you're thinking about because you want to be the best that you can be. And they already are. And it's like, even I know that they would still strive to be better. And Lawrence is always thinking of ways he can improve, uh, which seems ridiculous to people like us, us humans. Um, but 
I just you can't have any worries. They're just and John Patitucci is such a nice guy and um was lucky enough to speak to him just after after the gig and um Dave Weckl seemed did uh, seemed <laughs> seemed did easy for me to say. Uh, he uh, he seemed really nice after the gig, and um, like you said with the Steve Gadd thing, it, it being a room full of drummers, it was like everybody, they the three of them parted ways after the show, and everyone was like, which one are we going to, Chick or Dave? Or it was like an equal mix, and um, so yeah, that's my that's my uh, number one. So just to recap, what's your um, what is your five to one list? So in- my my five to one list would go. Sting and Stuart Copeland at yep. number five. In at number four was Simon Phillips and Anthony Jackson. Mm-hmm. In at number three was Steve Gadd and Jimmy Johnson. Yep. Number two was Neil Peart and Geddy Lee. And then in at number one was Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. And for yourself? Uh, my five was Bernard Edwards and Tony Thompson. Number four, Joe Dart and Nate Smith. Um... Number three was Lawrence Cottle and Ian Thomas. Number two was Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. And uh, number one was John Patitucci and Dave Weckl. And some um, fine picks, I think you would agree. And, yeah. Um, for... I think we'll uh, cover additional players on other lists. I'm sure we will. And if you have a suggestion for a top five list that you would like us to do, do please get in touch. You know, we will be on, uh, by the time this goes out, we'll be on Instagram at Groovecast UK. And. Um, you know, feel free to or drop us a message privately, because yeah. we are always open for for ideas for podcasts. And if there's if there's a list you want us to cover, we'll absolutely cover it for you. And if you have your own uh, top five bass and drum duos that you prefer, feel free to comment them uh, or send them uh, to us directly as well. I think. Yeah. So <laughs> I think that's going to wrap us up for today, and yeah. uh, I think a really fulsome episode and. Hopefully, everyone who was listening had a notepad and pen to take down some of the uh, <laughs> to take down some of the the, the suggestions and the, the the things to look up because you know you could spend hours talking about this and we we probably could and we probably will at probably some point. Will. <laughs> but um, yeah, for for this episode of uh, Groovecast, that's us for today, and we shall see you next time. See you soon.